Hey everyone. Uh, so for this week's video, I have a bit of a scoop. I have something that uh, fell into my lap almost quite literally uh, within the last couple of days. And I was quite excited to receive this because it's something that I could not find anywhere on the internet. I could not find any articles about it or any notations or anybody talking about it in Scientology history. And yet it's something I did see and was given when I was in the Church of Scientology by an OSA staff member. Uh, this was when I was in uh, Santa Barbara on staff there. This is a letter from L. Ron Hubbard to Ronald Reagan. And this was written in November of 1980. And uh, to set up a little bit of context to this, uh, Hubbard at this time had just gone into hiding. Uh, he had taken off. He was only, uh, only a few people knew where he was at this time. And, uh, and he was actually in California. The letter uh, is, uh, has a P.O. box return address uh, in Tampa, Florida, which would make sense because uh, Hubbard would want to have any, any, uh, I, anybody with any ideas of where he was, he'd want to send them off as far away from him as possible. In the 1980s, the Church of Scientology was at war with the IRS. They lost their tax exemption uh, in the United States in 1967, and they fought legally to try to get it back unsuccessfully up, in, you know, up, up through the 1970s and the 1980s. One of the efforts that was made by the church in order to put pressure on the IRS to get them to capitulate and give Scientology tax exemption again was to go after the IRS on the basis that tax, that income tax was evil and horrible and atrocious and was destructive to the economy. And what they did is there was a Scientologist who started a grassroots organization called CATS, or the Citizens for an Alternative Tax System. And the Church of Scientology uh, endorsed this and, and encouraged Scientologists to get involved with this grassroots movement as a way of putting pressure on the IRS. Uh, so much so that David Miscavige, and I wish I could find video of this somewhere, but I, I, I was not able to do so. But I remember this video that David Miscavige made standing on the steps of the IRS in Washington promoting Citizens for an Alternative Tax System. So this was not just some individual Scientologist, you know, going on a, on a rant with this grassroots movement. This was a church-endorsed operation. And it was one of just many that the church was engaged in in order to put pressure on the IRS. So what I thought I would do is rather than, we're going to go through this letter line by line, and I thought rather than just me saying, you know, my own experience with it, I am not an economics expert or, uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of background in that area. So I asked my two friends, Jeff Wassel and John P. Capitalist, to join me in this, and they were all more than happy to. So hi, guys. Thanks for uh, doing this with me. Hey, Chris. Pleasure to be with you again. Yes. And uh, I'm uh, glad to be making my debut on your podcast, Chris. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am. I am. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned before, when we were talking, I was so happy to finally put a face with the, with the voice and, and all the great work you've done, John. It's been uh, you, you've done some really championship work and in, in breaking down um, certain aspects of Scientology's financials and uh, and the economics of it that. I would never have been able to figure out otherwise. Well, well uh, thanks. Flatter, flattery will get you everywhere, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read. We're going to go through this letter paragraph by paragraph, and then I will get feedback from Jeff and John on uh, what their thinking is about what Hubbard is telling President-elect Reagan uh, at this time. And again, this was uh, dated 28 November 1980. Dear Sir, I am writing you because I very much want to see you make it. Inflation was apparently the key issue which swept you in. There is a way to handle it and, and then this word is a little hard to read, it could be survive, it could be succeed. The big thing that really propelled Reagan in many ways in addition to inflation was the whole nightmare of the 440-day 
Iranian hostage crisis. Even and I the, remember that, and I was 10 years old. Yeah, at the, the time. geopolitics of the time were very, very convoluted. And, you know, there was a lot of anger about the way Carter behaved. And, and I say this apolitically, I mean, that's just the way the, the country was feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a Reagan era Cold Warrior. I was in at the time. And it was a very uncertain time, especially considering, you know, Af- the Russian activity in Afghanistan. So, Inflation just compounded, I think, the general sense of angst in the country. I think there was a lot of, you know, people were looking for guidance. And, you know, the whole, you know, it's the, the campaign, prom, you know, that he, he used, uh, it's a new day in America, was very effective. You know, he had a very effective political ad at the time that really kind of set the tone about, you know, this is, let's, let's get rid of what's happened, let's move forward. And, you know, inflation was at, you know, almost 13% at the time. It's one of these things that I think was a combination of many things. And Hubbard, in his typical way, has just broken it down into something that is more germane to him than looking at the greater good, right? Yeah. So let's, you know, so let's think about this whole inflation thing. You know, for people that are not our age, um, Inflation is kind of a theoretical construct because we've had a very benign environment for uh, price inflation in the U.S. and most of the G20 countries. Um, But in the 1970s, uh, inflation was a big deal. And as Jeff says, inflation was running around 13 percent a year. So every year, the price of stuff you needed went up by 13 percent. And it's very stressful when that happens as a consumer because you know, you've got to hope that you're going to get a big enough raise to do that, uh, you know, to keep buying whatever you need to feed your family, put gas in the car and so forth. Um, there had been a number of spectacular failures under administrations throughout the 70s. You know, Nixon had uh, what is called a wage price freeze. This is almost inconceivable today. He decreed that I think it was for 90 days or 120 days, you couldn't raise prices of anything and you couldn't raise wages for anything. This is almost today the sort of thing you would expect to see in Venezuela and similar hell holes. And, and, you know, but that was, that was about the state of the art in economic policy. So inflation was a big problem. And the other thing that happens when inflation goes up is that interest rates go up as well. And so at the same time that inflation was 13%, the rate for a mortgage was 20%. Now, if you look at it today, you can get a 30-year mortgage for somewhere around 4% plus or minus, depending. And the notion that you'd have to pay 20% meant that the mortgage payments were staggeringly unaffordable for most people, especially when they were worried about inflation. So the housing market, people felt trapped. It was a very, very stressful time. And, And inflation was not just a problem in the U.S., it was also a problem in the U.K. and in much of Europe. So, you know, people who are coming of age in the last 20 years, just don't understand what a big deal this was. Carter's response to inflation was not successful. And so that was a big factor in why Reagan, with a message of sunny sort of optimism, was able to win in a landslide against an incumbent president. And so, you know, the the idea, you know, Hubbard's calling it correctly here when he says inflation was a, apparently the key issue which swept you in. Uh, yeah, and, and yes, the geopolitical situation, as Jeff pointed out, with the Iran hostage deal, that was also a big deal. Mm-hmm. And also, so, we're coming off the uh, the OPEC had just started flexing its muscles, too, don't forget. So yeah, you that had was the whole oil crisis that right, really so 1973. hammered the global economy. So I think right, it was right. a perfect storm in many ways. Okay, exactly. good. Well, the and point so, I wanted to give that context for was because Alan Hubbard didn't give a – he didn't care about any of that stuff. I mean, he no. was very insulated – and isolated in his own little world, and Scientology was actually, at this time, Scientology was at its peak, as far as I'm concerned, as far as all the information I have about numbers and number of people who were in Scientology and how Scientology was doing. It was booming at this time. The Mission Network, especially at this time, had missions. Scientology has missions and then orgs and, you know, then the Sea Org. So these lower level mission groups, which could deliver auditing up to the level of clear and minor training courses, they concentrated on the auditing. Some of these missions, and my parents at this time worked at the Pasadena mission, were delivering hundreds of hours of auditing a week and had packed course rooms. I was, like I said, 10 years old at this time, and I remember 
uh, very clearly those times. And I wanted to make sure I got a note in here that Hubbard was always consistent through all the years of Dianetics and Scientology, through his lectures and his writings, uh, that he was anti-tax, hated taxes, thought that it was outright theft, and that, uh, that the government should never, have, ever have passed income tax, and uh, fed into, used some of that in his conspiracy theories that he formulated in the late 60s and, and promulgated through the 70s, that the bankers were the ones who were uh, artificially messing with markets and messing with uh, economies in order to uh, advance their own personal agenda. And he even referred to one-worlders in some of his writings. And so the <laughs> idea that, you know, these guys were more powerful than all the governments and were, you know, working on this. So his effort here is to finally get a line in to a president who he thought he could appeal to on this point of, you know, establish a common reality on inflation, and I got an idea for you to deal with this and handle it and be, you know, wildly successful as a president and at the same time get a, a, a tremendous amount of personal benefit, L. Ron Hubbard would, because he had already amassed, you know, millions of dollars in offshore accounts so through, the, through the 70s. And he uh, also at this time had just gone into hiding, I think I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons being tax evasion. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to put all that context there, uh, you know, from Hubbard's point of view as well as the bigger view that you guys just gave. So then this is, uh, he starts, uh, this next paragraph is just a real whopper. <laughs> When I studied economics at Princeton decades ago, they still knew basic economics. But the economic scene has been muddied by two foreign importations, Lord Keynes and Karl Marx. <laughs> you can trace the economic tragedy of today to them. Their think was dedicated to plausible destruction. <laughs> All right, what do you guys have to say about that? Well, one, like Ronald Reagan's going to understand Scientology's for the scene and what think is. <laughs> well, <laughs> one. So, so, so let's so let's uh, let's look at a couple of let's look at the first thing, right? The first whopper and probably one of the best in the whole letter is <laughs> Hubbard studying economics at Princeton. Hubbard yeah. was never a student at Princeton. And what this refers to, um, as Chris Owen has covered in his, quote, Ron the War Hero um, little mini history book, is that Hubbard was assigned in 1944 to a training seminar for a couple of months for some sort of administrative function in the Navy. And the Navy was basically using space at Princeton um, because, you know, obviously college enrollment was way down, so they had classrooms and dormitories available. And so the, this was just, you know, a real estate deal at at Princeton, it wasn't that Hubbard was ever a student. And while whatever he was studying may have made mention of economics, you know, it was, certainly was not a course on economic study. Um, and then he goes on to talk about two guys, Lord Keynes, who was John Maynard Keynes, who came up with a very, very influential economic idea in the 1930s. I'll talk about it in a second. And the second was Karl Marx, who was the sort of spiritual inventor of communism when it was still sort of a fashionable intellectual idea and before it turned into, you know, as implemented as a totalitarian state with, you know, the Russian, you know, Soviet Union and Chinese uh, uh, experiments there. So, so what was Keynes about? Keynes was about the idea that you could help reduce the impact of economic depressions by having the government spend more during a depression and then you dial back spending when the economy's good. You cut taxes in... A, in a depression, you increase spending, and if you have to run a deficit and the government has to borrow money to sustain that on a temporary basis, that's okay, because you can pay it back when things get better. And when you think about it, there's a certain amount of sense, because in a depression, people are going to hang on to the cash that they have because of the uncertainty out there, right? That they're not going to be able to count on having a job. So in order to feed their family, they're going to they're going to just stop buying anything other than necessities just because it's a depression. So even if the depression is not happening to them, it might. 
And so the, the economic activity goes down. And poor people who may be homeless, you know, and, and, and remember, we're talking about Ke- uh, Keynes hatching his ideas in the Great Depression in the 1930s. At that point, over 25% of Americans were out of work. Homelessness was everywhere. And there was very little hope because nothing that the government seemed to do uh, would end up, you know, really kickstarting the economy until they started doing Keynesian uh, projects of all sorts. And you can read about all of the FDR quote, the New Deal. You can read about all that stuff. And so the, the idea of conflating Keynesian economics, which is legitimate, and, and, Ken, and Keynes was a capitalist. This is not some communist. He is not aligned with Marx. He would have laughed at Marx. And so, you know, conflating these two guys together is a way of trying to say that, you know, essentially anything you do to help people in a depression is bad. And it's as evil as communism. So he's really conflating this. And, you know, the fact is, yeah, inflation was an economic tragedy. And it was really painful. But the reality is inflation was a result of a number of flawed government policies. I'm not a, an economic historian. Um, while I'm familiar with economics from my work at Global Capitalism Headquarters, I'm not an economist. I have to understand the general concepts, but I'm not going to argue economic history on this. But the idea, then, the sentence, then this paragraph concludes by saying, their think was dedicated to plausible destruction. And the fact is that neither Marx nor Keynes were trying to destroy America or destroy the capitalist system. Marx thought he had a better alternative, and I think he would have been horrified had he lived to see how the Soviets practiced it in a totalitarian uh, environment. So, so anyway, so this is just a complete whopper. And, and so, but it's also this sort of know-nothing, uh, it's sort of this know-nothing attitude of Hubbard that basic economics is superior to all the smart economic eggheads out there. And, and one thing, even if you don't like Reagan, he actually had some pretty smart guys that were, in, you know, cabinet members, the secretary of the treasury and uh, Paul Volcker at the Fed. These guys were not stupid guys. They actually knew real economics and not the schoolboy economics that Hubbard is trying to propose in this letter. Okay. So, sorry to go on. Okay. So sorry to go no, on. No, no. I appreciate your, your input on that. Jeff, what do you have to say throw in this one? Yeah. I, and to to JP's points, I think the other thing too is that it really shows Hubbard has no concept of economics, really. In that economics do not uh, Keynesian economics is very he's very adamant about there is money does not work in a vacuum, markets don't work in a vacuum. The whole economy is interchanged. Things happen. There are irregularities. There are things that go on. Hubbard's trying to sit there and say, okay, you fix tax policy, everything else is going to fall into place, which is just ludicrous, you know, and especially at that time, you know, um, JP alluded to FDR's New Deal, you had the Civilian Conservation Corps, the National Recovery Act, stuff that was highly interventionalist. Um, in fact, there was a lot of the old guard that thought it was, you know, oh my God, here's the first vanguard of socialism creeping in. But you also have to remember that socialism was already endemic in America at the time. You had the international workers of the world, or the, the, what were called the Wobblies. You know, labor was becoming big time in, in as a political force and also as a social force in the country. So, you know, to sit there and poo-poo Marxism and socialism and communism is, 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 is just irrelevant, is just daft. You know, and more importantly, it showed in a way the vibrancy of the what was going on in the country at the time to fix what was just a horrible situation. So for him to just say that these guys are destructive or these particular you know political philosophies are destructive is just it's stupid. It's ignorant, and it shows that he has no idea of what the hell he's talking about, uh, which is you know kind of par. So I, uh, it's that's that that is pretty much how <laughs> Hubbard would. It do is what it is with he, him. And, it, and, you know, you just published, uh, you know, just today, we're recording this here on, on Wednesday, you just published a, a, a breakdown of deconstructing a few other examples yeah. uh, of Hubbard, you know, pulling things out of current events or historical incidents and contextualizing them into a point he's trying to make by altering the truth of what actually happened. But he makes it sound like he's hip and knows what he's talking about because he's putting just enough in there to refer to things that people might have heard about or be familiar with in some way. 
But if you're not, you know, if you don't really know what Lord Keynes said or what Karl Marx was really all about, you'll make the connections Hubbard expects you to make rather than connecting with the truth. And this is I'm how just... Hubbard indoctrinated a lot of Scientologists into some very kooky ideas beyond Scientology and Xenu and all that. He made commentary on economics, on finance, on uh, legal issues that, you know, that even after people leave Scientology, they hold on to those, what they think are non-Scientological ideas, but they were actually influenced by Hubbard and his lies. And, and I see that, you know, I see that on social media, I see that, you know, around in the X community and it, and it always bothers me when I see that sort of thing. I, would, uh, I want to leave the, the audience with one last counter to this whole idea of destruction, too. Um, Keynes was very big in founding the IMF, or what was known as the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1946, which basically created the global structure that we have in place to prevent depressions or catastrophic global events, at, you know, economic events that can bring everybody to their knees or in the case of, you know, pre- the 30s, World War II, for crying out loud. So, if anything, he had a very altruist, he understood the relationship of money and culture, and the way that culture and, and government, and how that all intertwines as far as, you know, again, money policy, capital markets, central banks, all that has to work. And they really solidified a lot of that in I, in, at the IMF in 46. You know, before then, everything kind of operated independently or in a vacuum. And, and governments, you know, the gold standard was still in place. I mean, there was just a lot of stuff going on. And Keynes right. said, well, wait a minute. Let's baseline this. Let's at least, you know, if we can, figure out a way to help the developing world, number one. Because remember, we have to feed, you know, they're looking at funding the Marshall Plan, rebuilding Europe. A lot of, lot of money stuff going on at this point in time. So for him to come out and say that this is destructive is just ludicrous. All right, fair enough. Well, let's go to the next paragraph. Hubbard says, if you were, and this is where he makes the pitch, if you were to forthrightly abolish income tax and substitute for it a 10% federal sales tax, percentage adjustable for commodities like stocks and bonds, which have repeated sales, the federal government would have more money than it has now. The quote-unquote rich who buy things would bear a lot of the tax, and this could be used as an argument for the plan. The 16th Amendment does not require Congress to tax incomes. It only authorizes it to do so and can cancel its own laws. It could also make it attractive to states to abolish theirs. All right, feedback on that one? Um, okay, so so here's the thing. This is an argument that very, very frequently people try. It sounds simple, right? Mm -hmm. Abolish the IRS and just have a national sales tax. So who would pay that? Well, if it's a sales tax on everything, basically that's a tax on stuff you consume. And you note that Hubbard specifically says that stocks and bonds should be exempted. You shouldn't have a sales tax on them, which you know is very eminently reasonable. You should deal with profits from trading stocks a different way, right? So in other words, if you pay $100 for a share of IBM, you shouldn't have to pay $10 sales tax to the government. That's insane. And Hubbard, you know, of, of course, that, that makes perfect sense. But, but if you tax consumption, who, you know, rich people don't consume very much. So, so for example, you know, people in Wall Street, the guys at the top make staggering bonuses, some cases tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Do they take that money and go out and buy cars with it? Do they buy more houses? No, not really. They invest it. They turn around and put it to work in the market. And on the other hand, poor people who are really struggling to get by, they spend everything they make often before they make it, right? That they're, they're always running really close to the edge. So if you have poor people who now have to pay a sales tax on food, who have to pay a sales tax on the electricity that they use or the oil that they use to heat their home, that they have to pay a sales tax on gasoline beyond the taxes that are already built into the, the price of gas. Literally, you're talking about you know passing on a 10% increase in costs to people who just don't have that much money. Now, if you look at contemporary numbers, I don't have the numbers for the past, think about this statistic. 
50% of the households in this country do not have $500 in liquid cash sitting around that they can use for an emergency car repair, to repair the car that takes them to work. And they've either got to borrow it, they've got to stiff uh, uh, some, you know, the electric bill or the mortgage company, or they've got to do something um, to pay for a car repair. And in, interestingly, this is not just a problem with poor people because of those households, 20% of the households that make hundred grand a year are so over leveraged with car payments and mortgages and whatnot that they actually don't have 500 in cash sitting around. They'd have to put it on a credit card. So, you know, there's a lot bigger problem with people close to the edge. And you're talking about being able to bury the poor. And if you've got to cut back on what little you can afford, what's going to happen? They're going to buy fewer groceries. Merchants are going to suffer. You know, there's a lot of money selling to lower income people. That's Walmart's demographic, and it's the biggest retailer in the world. So basically, you know, you have this, you have this tax, which essentially burdens the poor as a percentage of, of income far more than the rich. So a guy making 10 million a year might only consume a half a million to a million dollars a year worth of stuff. 100,000 tax burden, that's 1% of that guy's income on a $10 million salary. A poor person who's making 30 grand a year and they're spending all of it with the exception of rent, they've got a 2,000 or $2,500 tax bill. That's, that's ridiculous. And if states move to that model, you know, you're looking at more like 15%. So let's look at what the numbers would look like today if we went to this, this, sta uh, this status. If, if you look at the federal government, it's about $1.6 trillion for programs other than uh, Social Security and so forth. That implies that a, a tax burden would, to replace the income tax would be about 14% federal, and it would probably be 4 to 5% at the state level. So you got a 20% sales tax on everything not 10% like Hubbard is, is talking about. That would be in order, Just in order to sustain what we have right now. And that's what That's exactly the makeup, right. the difference from canceling and, the income tax. We have to go up to 15 to 20% VAT tax or sales tax to make up for that. On yes. everything. And, and if you say, and if you take mortgage interest and other stuff out of the equation, it would be actually a little bit higher. And that's if you left Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment in place. And those taxes are typically about, about eh, well, when you look at the employer contribution, you're looking at about 20% of, of income. So you either got to eliminate, um, you either got to eliminate Social Security, and by the way, think about that, 40% to 50% of Americans have less than $10,000 of retirement savings. So what are you going to do? Are you talking about just letting people starve in the streets like it was 100 years ago? You're going straight back to Victorian times. And, you know, you have to think about, you know, if you, if you want to preserve Social Security and Medicaid and all of that and eliminate those taxes, then you've got a sales tax of 40%. It's ludicrous. So, wow. so the thing, the idea that the, quote, rich who buy things would bear a lot of the tax, and this could be used as an argument for the plan, is absolutely ludicrous. And then the last sentence where Hubbard talks about the amendment, the 16th Amendment doesn't require Congress to collect income tax. It just allows them. So Hubbard is basically with his usual sort of clueless, bumbling sense of daring do saying, oh, all, all we need to do is just tell Congress to repeal the tax law. No problem. <laughs> Done. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's and that is how he communicated it to Scientologists is just get rid of it. Like what's the it's kind of like the just say no thing. To, hey, come on, just just get rid of it. What's the big deal? You know? Yeah, well, that was the very thing about, simple that way. Yeah. And that's a very big thing about, you know, tax law and politics in general is that the thing that will kill you is not the 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 front effect, you know, the frontal effect. It's the unintended consequences of some decision. And so people who do real policy work, which you know, we seem to have been getting away from uh, a little bit in the last year or so. Um, but if you actually try to, to do policy competently, you spend all your time worrying about the unintended consequences. And right. so it sounds simple to say, sure, just put a national sales tax in place, repeal, you know, outlaw the IRS. But then what? You know, what it about reminds this? me, you know, what you're talking about reminds me of the wrong analogy of comparing the government budget to a personal budget. You know, well, they should just balance their budget. They just need to balance their checkbook and everything, you know, or they just, 
you know, they're running this tremendous debt. And this is a, you know, and if I did that with my own personal income, then, uh, you know, then, then horrible, horrible, horrible things. But, but running a government and an economy is a very different thing from running your personal finances. Well, it's an you know, analogy same, that doesn't quite work. What, what cracks me up, by the way, is that a lot of times the people who are so righteous about saying that have mortgages, car loans, and credit cards. And so if you want to say the government should balance the budget, then you should buy a house for cash, buy cars for cash, and cut up your credit cards. So, exactly. you know, it's like, come on. It's not even right. funny. It's it's not e it's not even a bad analogy. It's just ludicrous. Right. Well, I just wanted to point that out because it's the way that uh, people I knew in the church thought. Uh, it was the way that I thought uh, because this is how I was educated on these matters. Was this is as much attention and education as I, as a Scientologist and Sea Org member, could put into this. I didn't go and study Lord King. I didn't know this stuff. So I just took Hubbard, I took what Hubbard said and said, oh, well, that's, that sounds, it sounds like it makes sense. So it must make sense. You know, so I just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. well, what do you, again, what do you got on this, like, Jeff? Well, I was going to say, it's, again, this idea that economies, even our personal spending, operates in a vacuum. It doesn't. I mean, you make a conscious effort to use credit wisely because it, it provides you a way to, you know, leverage your existing ability to repay something, your credit worthiness, all these things that come about by the way you are in society, right? Hubbard is a nihilist. He never looks at the world around him. This is a thing that, I, you know, is always coming back, you know, this whole thing about control. So, you know, if we look at these parallels in the way we handle our money as individuals versus the way the government does, for one thing, we as individuals aren't, we don't have legislative fiat telling us that there's certain ways that we have to budget, there's certain ways that we have to make carve-outs for defending the country, or all these other things that, you know, nation states need. But, you know, if you run with that, there's there's a prudence to borrowing. It's okay to borrow. This is the whole point of, this is the social contract we make. Uh, you know, within our marriages, within ourselves, within society, that we will live within our means and things like this, right? Government, to the most, you know, for the most part, tries to do that. It must, or else that's where uh, you have complete, you know, anarchy. Because, but yet it has vehicles that it can use. It's got the capital markets that it can go out and borrow, sell bonds, what have you. I mean, it's it's just an order of magnitude larger version of what we do at home, but with a lot more strictures. So again, Hubbard's sitting here saying, well, yeah, you can just yank tax right out of there. Okay, so where's the government going to get money for infrastructure? And then he's telling, oh, the states, they can get, they don't need to tax either. So how is he going to get the permitting, the, the plot, you know, the sewer lines laid for all his orgs? All, I mean, he never thinks the long game, you know, it's just classic. Right. It's all about me. Let's look at, you know, and, and we'll just make it go right. Well, last time I looked, I don't think Scientology, even with the, you know, the Estates Project Force could lay 800 miles of interstate by itself, right? So this is where it gets really just, again, ridiculous, you know, and looking through the end of it, it's just, it's, it's a panacea. He's saying, you know, let's yank it out there just so I can be happy. I can, you know, move my money offshore, or if I keep it here. I can put little bundles in, the, in uh, shoe boxes in the closet or in a bank, but you know I don't want it to be a bank that is uh, you know beholden to a government. I just want it to be a bank that pays me interest. Well, you know, come on, what's it right. going to be, right? Yeah, He's exactly. always you know trying to game it against you know one the, the means <laughs> against you know it's always coming back to him. So it, I, exactly, and that's how I that's when I read this that was how I saw it. Looking at it now. You know, uh, taxation is, I think this is a thing, taxation is a social contract between the governed and the govern, the government. You know, there's, there is, you know, nobody rides for free as it were. There's an implied, there has to be an implied exchange there. I'm going to give you some of my hard-earned money so that I have security, I have fire police, I have libraries, all this stuff. Let me just, um, let me yeah. just sort of throw in one thing before we move on. One thing that, um, just going back to history, one thing that we need to understand is that Tax rates were much higher when Reagan took office than they were today, and and it wasn't that Carter necessarily raised them. This had been historically a feature of the U.S. tax system since forever. And I, as I recall, the high the tax rate, if you were making, you know, the equivalent of a million dollars a year today, was something like seventy five percent. Yeah, um, ridiculous. And so it was very high. 
Although it's important to understand it was actually lower than most other, you know, Western European advanced economies, uh, whether it was Japan, anywhere in, you know, um, Western Europe. So the U.S. has traditionally been a substantially lower tax burden than other places. So when you, you know, when you look at all of Hubbard's whining and moaning about taxes, um, you know, relative to other economies, the U.S. is actually a pretty good deal. And, and that's been historically true, even when the tax rate was 73 percent, what they call the marginal rate. So so that was on the income above a certain amount. You didn't pay 73 percent of everything. You know, and there were a lot more deductions, by the way. But of course. Um, but so you the, hear the, the term the, tax exile, Chris. You know, in the '70s and '80s, Britain, for instance, taxed at almost 90 percent of marginal income for high net worth earners. So you know, the Rolling Stones. You know, they moved to Morocco. You know, you always hear about this stuff. Or you know, they would. There was this thing: if you lived less than 90 days, you didn't get hit with a full rate. Everybody was gaming the system because of these really high tax rates. So, you know, again, there's this whole idea of, you know, what's proportional to Hubbard. Nothing is because he wants to keep it all right. Right. Exactly. So, again. All right. Fair enough. Well, let's uh, we're on page two now. And he says income tax removes the money from the society in the wrong place before it is spent. Substituting a sales tax for it would put the money out into the marketplace. All right. Now, even I can see what's wrong with this, but go ahead and <laughs> tell me what's yeah, wrong with this. This. Is, this is just this is just like stupid. This is eighth grade level thinking here. So basically, the reality is, you know, what it, what Hubbard is making it sound like is the government, you know, the, your employer gives you money and then the government knocks on your door and says, I would like 37 percent of your paycheck that you just got at work today. I'd like that right now, please. So there's, but the reality is with withholding, nobody sees that money. People rationally understand how much they have to spend. And it doesn't matter really whether it was taxed, uh, you know, whether it was given and then taxed or whether it was never taxed in the first place. You know how much money you got coming in for most people week to week. And even if you're some self-employed person, you generally have a pretty clear idea. And so the notion that, um, taxing your money before you spend it is is bad is is ludicrous because think about what we just said about a national sales tax when you are about to spend when you're making a decision to spend money you know that that price is 10% higher than it would otherwise be and you're you know going to be more strapped so i mean this is just this is just nonsense i mean it's just you're you're you are going to have a disincentive from consumption if everything you buy is taxed at Hubbard says 10%. Reality today would be more like 18 to 20. Right. Well, okay, more important good. too is that mm -hmm. you have sound tax policy that says I can I can pay my taxes quarterly. I can pay the, what I owe the government in a way that matches the way that I spend or earn. So you know, if there's not a mechanism that is agreed to to collect tax, i.e., an organization, what have you, then again, you have anarchy in the way that you know this money is going to be allocated obtained, what have you, right? And so it's it's silly that he would even think that. And especially, you know, the thing that's really ironic here is a high net earner or, you know, high net worth individual, you know, he, you would think that he would want a process in place that he would be able to better leverage his income, either through tax, you know, tax shelters or all the legal permutations that go with a tax regime. But no, he just wants it, you know, across the board in a certain just way. Just wants it He's screwing the pooch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I, I really I really believe that this is not a case of Hubbard um, purposefully deceiving or putting out information here that is an effort to, like, he really gets it, but he's saying this because, you know, it's going to serve some advantage to him. I believe that in this particular case, when it came to this subject matter, this is how he really thought. Mm-hmm. That's 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 my take on it, at least. Because, like I said, he was consistent with this in every lecture, in every place he ever said anything about this. It never changed through three and a half decades of him yap yap yapping about stuff. Uh, and he would go on rants about income tax and and economics all the time in his lectures. You know what's really what's really interesting. I spend a lot of time looking at you know these these uh, fringe political types, the sovereign citizen movement, and other you know fringe nut jobs. And people seem to feel that they have 
the right to, you know, hold forth on economics. And yet these are the same people. They wouldn't dream of walking in, uh, you know, to look at a, a sur- you know, to talk to and interview a surgeon for a consult and tell the surgeon how to remove their appendix. But some, for some reason, people just feel free to just bloviate all sorts of random crap about economics. And, you know, it's just, it's just truly bizarre that Hubbard thinks that this stuff is easy. It's not. There's a reason that people on Wall Street, especially chief economists at investment banks, make a lot of money. This shit is hard. Right. Very good point. Thank you for making that. All right. Well, here Hubbard then says, the banks would not like it at first glance as it would become possible for companies and individuals to work hard to make money, save up and use it, bypassing loans. But banks cannot prosper at double-digit inflation, and their survival would depend upon such a change. It would remove some of their excess paper from the market. Ignoring the fact that you know banks are beholden to a central bank, and that there's you know concept of fiscal policy and monetary policy, you know that banks are not the end all here, right? It's just one vehicle for capital flow. It's a place that one, you know, keeps capital, that allocates capital through loans or bond issues or what have you. But at the end of the day, the government is going to figure out the way through fiscal policy and monetary policy, how money works. In monetary policy, it's the way interest rates are set, how much money they need to print, you know, or not print, depending, you know, there's quantitative easing, you've heard that term, versus sitting down and working with central banks to say, okay, well, here's the picture, this is where we need to be. You know, the banks will loan I mean, there's a whole other fiduciary ecosystem out there. There's credit unions. There's all these, I mean, you know, banks are just not one thing in the way that money moves in America, nor the way one obtains it. This is, I mean, again, it just shows what an idiot he is. He has no clue about what he's talking about. So anyway. So, so let's, so let's, let's take a, you know, Jeff's point, I think about, you know, the complexity of the financial ecosystem is, is right because, you know, what, what what it points to is the financial ecosystem is actually very efficient, and and so and but what Hubbard is what Hubbard is doing is he's talking about you know the idea that well you know the banks who are uh, obviously another shadowy conspiracy uh, in <laughs> Hubbard land is uh, that the banks wouldn't like it because all of a sudden people would spend people would have so much extra money that they wouldn't need to go out and get loans and so of course the banks are going to oppose this because you know they're evil. Now the reality is, let's say in 1980 you were making 40 grand a year, which was not a bad salary back then, and you were paying 30% in taxes, so you were paying 12,000 a year in taxes. And then let's pretend that, let's pretend that those taxes all just went away. And the reality is that 12 grand, you know, at at the time, so 40 grand, you you know, the average house price in the U.S. was probably around $100,000 in 1980. You know, more on the coast, less in the middle, but in in large metro areas, 100,000 or 120,000 for a house. You've now freed up $12,000 by eliminating taxes. And if you say that somehow this is going to eliminate banks, right? The people are going to now have money to just pay cash for a house with where the houses were at. That's fantasy land. Exactly. 12,000 a year, you would have to save up for 10 years if all of a sudden the banks were out of the picture. Nobody would buy a house because it's hard. Stuff always happens, you know, and and stuff happens to eat into your savings. So, so the idea there's is- no there's no actuarial fiduciary security in his model, Chris. You know, you're you're. At, I mean, this is where stuffing mattresses comes from, right? This is what Hubbard is proposing. <laughs> That's right. You know, we have That's this right. cash. It is, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it's very. You know, I don't know. I just keep returning to the idea that Hubbard grew up in the Midwest. During the Depression, you know, I think a lot of his thinking was formulated then, and he bought into some pretty goofy ideas. And well, you know, banks those. were evil; they repossessed your farms and all that. Sure, but at the end of the day, that was—I mean—that's the function of the way the economy. Wor- I mean, you sign a deed. This is—it's a paper-based, relationship-based, trust-based system. You know that that has checks and balances in it. 
And right. if you're going to be in that ecosystem, this is the result, unfortunately. But then this is where government and taxation steps up when that happens with the National Recovery Act and things like that, or you know, Obamacare and our, whatever you want to call it, a safety net of sorts that is based on the social contract of taxation. Right. So you know, we're just not leaving people out there. You know, and the, the, the other thing that Hubbard just and this is this is like again eighth grade economic thinking. So he says banks can't prosper at double digit inflation and their survival would depend on making a change, presumably what he's talking about to a tax system. So, so this is just stupid wrong. So here's the thing. Banks are smart. I've, I've worked with guys who are chief economists at large banks. They're smart guys. They, and, but the thing is banks, the, the interest rate that banks charge is a function of the expected rate of inflation. So if, in our example, at Reagan's election, 13% inflation, 21% mortgage interest. So the bank's charging 8% above mortgage interest. They've got room built in for inflation to go a couple of points higher. The bank's going to make scads of money if the inflation rate goes down to 5% and they're still getting 21% for that loan. And, and so banks will make money pretty much in any kind of inflation environment except for, you know, like the hyperinflation that we're seeing in Venezuela or Zimbabwe or, you know, crazy places right. like that. Right. And, and so this, again, the idea that somehow banks are doomed because of the inflation rate, not true. Incidentally, banks are so much more efficient now. So today the inflation rate's running at two point something percent. A 30-year fixed mortgage is around 4%. So the spread between the inflation rate and the interest rate is not 8% like it was in Reagan's era, it's 2%. That's a pretty well-managed environment. So there's not a lot of efficiency. There's not a lot of risk based into the banking system at this point. Um, okay. So anyway, it's just more Hubbard. You know, this is this is. I mean, this is exactly what you'd expect of a junior high student trying to learn economics and just not being able to think through this stuff. The socialist inheritance taxes often punish firms who have to find the money for estates. They can wreck a lot of people and do. The have-not vengeance against the successful should be abolished. Now, this, is, this even speaks to some of the thinking that I've seen going on now. You know, that we hate those estates tag. I mean, Trump was railing against something like this, I believe. Yeah, but here's the thing. Punish firms. No, you're punishing individuals. I mean, businesses don't inherit, right? <laughs> it's people. <Through> that. <laughs> So, I mean, the whole thing is just right there is ludicrous. Maybe the closest you could come is, you know, in family owned companies and things like that, you know, but again, they're structured, their personal finances are going to be separate from the way the corporate finances are in this stuff. So what is he alluding to here? I mean, it's nonsensical. Yeah, it's, well, it's just I, one thing I'd like to <laughs> One thing I'd like to comment on real fast is that the last sentence of this paragraph, the have not vengeance have hyphen not, the have not vengeance against the successful should be abolished. That's pretty much his entire concept in one sentence. Yeah. He yeah. he thinks the government is is enacting some kind of vengeance against successful people in society who are producing. And he thinks he's one of those people. And he thinks that the, that that government is just raping him of his money, of his fortune, for because they want to get back at him because he's successful and they're just a bunch of government nerds and they don't know anything and they couldn't produce their way out of a wet paper bag. That's, I, I'm p positive that is his attitude and we could literally put this entire letter into that sentence and that's basically what he's trying to communicate to Reagan. I think yeah. there's another huge irony here too is that this is why you have law. You know, and he has, as we know, just an abject disdain for WOG law. He's great at suing people with law. But what this is why you have trust. This is why you set up trust. This is why you avoid probate. I mean, there's vehicles to maintain your wealth after death. Yeah, I, I read this slightly differently than you did, Chris, that last sentence. That oh, it's the, that? Have not, the have nots are the people, the poor people. It's not necessarily the people in government who are, you know, envious of rich people. It's the poor people out there that he thinks are driving the policy to tax the, to tax the rich. And, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, this is very much the sort of Ayn Rand, you know, Randroid kind of, you know, that there are producers and takers and that, 
you know, the producers are the victims of people who don't want to actually do anything useful and just want to steal our money. And, you know, I think the reality is a little different, but this is very consistent with the whole Scientology thing of poor people pulled it in. You know, it's like, sure, people do, you know, some people do make bad choices, right? They make choices to cut school and go smoking with their friends instead of learning something that could get them a better job. They make choices to, you know, become drug addicts and they make other bad choices as well. But other people don't really pull it in. You know, if you're born in Appalachia, you could make a whole bunch of good choices and the deck's still massively stacked against you. And, you know, so, but this is very much the whole Hubbard, you know, where it intersects with, you know, this Calvinist kind of, well, I'm, I am rich because God smiles on me. You know, I am the elect of God and the proof is in my wealth or the Randroid, you know, the Ayn Rand stuff or Scientology with pulling it in. And, right. But you're exactly right. This is the whole Hubbard letter in a nutshell. Or exactly. society owes me because I came up with Scientology. So why should I have to pay to play? You know, I've, I've got this tech that's going to save the world. So what if you cross the street and got hit by a car? <laughs> Tough you, right? I mean, it's Something just all like about. That. Well, then he then he takes a stab at Social Security. He says, Social Security is really a farce. FDR put it in because he needed money right then, which he would not have to repay until much later. The big insurance companies would be utterly delighted to have it phased over to them and off the government's back. So this is nonsense, right? So the, the idea was... So, so what, what Hubbard is saying is that FDR started collecting Social Security taxes now and then putting it somewhere in ma magic place until you retire 40 years hence. But that's not how Social Security works. The money comes in now goes to pay people who are collecting benefits now. The money doesn't live in some magic savings bank of, you know, the Federal Reserve or something like that. And that was never, you know, this is the way that all you know, sort of modern social insurance schemes work. It worked out, it's, it works in every country in the world that has some sort of government driven, you know, retirement income. And so, you know, the idea that Hubbard, that FDR was somehow taking money from workers and then spending it on something else. And then, you know, that this was a loan scheme to, to loan money to the government is just nonsense. And, you know, so Hubbard is talking about the idea that insurance companies are going to you know, turf this over to, you know, that the, the idea of the private retirement, you know, privatizing Social Security. Yeah, so Hubbard's talking about this 40 years later. Again, incredibly bad idea because, you know, the big problem is privatizing Social Security puts market risk into the Absolutely. equation. And markets do go down. And the thing about guaranteed benefit pension programs, you know, private old style pensions as opposed to 401ks, and the, the thing about Social Security is you don't have market risk. And the fact is that the majority of people in this country don't have the education, the training to be able to make appropriate decisions when they have market risk for their investments. It takes a lot of work to run your own retirement in a 401k just to make sure that you're deciding where to put your resources. You know, you might be spending you know, dozen or two dozen, to do it right, you're going to be spending a couple of dozen hours a month. It's a lot of work. And not a lot of people have the education and the skills necessary to do that. You know, for an educated person, it's not hard, but it's still work. And Social Security doesn't have, doesn't require people to make decisions. It's just there. So, so this is all just, you know, this is just more just bullshit. And, we'll see, and I guess to that point, we're seeing that what happened with Obamacare in for-profit insurers pulling out of the markets that were created to support regional or national health care across the board, you know, uniform standard. The thing about Social Security, it's guaranteed, you know, and this is the power of government. The, the, the markets can't guarantee. They, they're not allowed to guarantee a return. And as JP said, uh, who wants to be worrying about that in your golden years? I mean, you got to worry about health care and all this other stuff. I mean, it's ludicrous. Yeah, exactly. So, but I all guess right, if well, you're on coming... the whole track, you're coming back. It doesn't matter, right? Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, we're coming down the home stretch here. He says, production has to be raised to absorb excess paper. The fast way to do it is simply abolish income tax shifting the buying power over to the marketplace. Abolish inheritance and withholding taxes 
and get the money into people's pockets to be spent. Again, just utter nonsense. It's probably, you know, we've kind of, to, to de debunk this, we'd just be going over some familiar ground. You know, we, I don't think we need to waste much time on this paragraph. The killer is what comes next. Yeah, and he says, I realize that with your floods of mail, this letter will probably never reach your eyes. But I would feel bad knowing what would bail you out if I did not send it in your direction. Now, I, I want to comment on this because uh, it is um, odd for Hubbard to expect his communication to not be received or acknowledged or acted upon. Um, you know, this is a guy who's just come out of, you know, 10, 12 years of, of people waiting on him hand and foot, and he's still got people, you know, waiting on him hand and foot. Uh, I believe my guess here, speculation, is that he knew that this letter was going to be something that was probably going to be circulated within the church. And I think Hubbard, having spent 13 years trying to figure out at this point what to do about the IRS and about the income tax problem and the gigantic bill that the Church of Scientology had accumulated at this point because they had not been paying any income tax, or any taxes to the government for the last 13 years after they after their tax exemption was taken away, I think Hubbard was thinking with the idea of getting Scientologists behind this idea and somehow starting a grassroots movement, which is exactly what they ended up doing, you know, thus communicating to the Scientologists, see, I tried to tell him what to do. I gave him my infinite wisdom and he didn't listen, and we're still strapped with this income tax problem, so I guess it's up to us Scientologists to make it go right and, and, and make this happen. I don't know. What do you guys think? Exactly right. 100%. Yep. Hubbard's version of Thomas Paine's common sense, right? <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. Here's Thomas exactly right. Read this. This is the answer. Now we got to be revolutionaries. <laughs> That's Thomas right. Common sense is an oxymoron. No offense, Jeff. Like military <laughs> intelligence. Yeah, right. Absolutely. You know, I, right, I, there is one thing too. I wanted to circle back when he. The irony, of course, when he talks about production in the previous paragraph, he's talking about controlling the means of production, which is classic Marxist theory, right? And earlier he's saying, no, 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 Marxist. You know, Marxism. No, no, no. Can't go there, right? You know, I yeah. just. <laughs> All right, so wrapping this up, I'm going to go through the last two paragraphs, and then we will wrap this up here. He says, I'm an old, he starts, a, he starts the, uh, the conclusion to appealing to, uh, to Reagan here personally. I'm an old fan of yours. We were high up in Hollywood at the same time. I really quite desperately want you to succeed. I want to see you break the presidential tradition and leave office far more popular than you went in. Well, there. I have sent it your way. It's good, straight economics. The move is bold, but you will have to be bold to handle the awful mess Marx and Keynes got us in. Respectfully, L. Ron Hubbard. So, finishing uh, thoughts here, boys? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, think about this, right? Reagan was president of the Screen Actors Guild. He knew everybody in Hollywood yeah. from that work, more so than his actual acting career. And so if he had actually read this, which is incredibly unlikely, he would look at this and go, who is this? Who is this guy? <laughs> who's pretending that he's a hitter in Hollywood, right? There's one, you know, there's a huge invisible pecking order in Hollywood. And everybody knows who's bigger and badder than who. And so for Hubbard to come in and try and buddy up to Reagan, who, you know, was never that big as an actor, but was definitely a power, you know, power broker from his union work would have just been, you know, the guy that this would have been round filed as, you know, right. Remember the FBI file appears mental. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You, you know, there's one other thing, right. That Hubbard, you know, Hubbard has this long history of bloviation about, I mean, about all sorts of things he knew nothing about, but economics being one of them. Tony ran an article when he was at the Village Voice about, um, you know, one of those order of the day things that there was a big series that Tony ran 
for, you know, a year or two and had just some of these laughable, you know, you know, Elron explains it all for you kind of things. And there's, you know, there was a time when they were on the ship that Hubbard gave economic advice to Nixon, not in the form of a letter to him, but in the form of another communicate a staff. And so, you know, this it's it's easy to understand why this one fell through the cracks, because this was just another turd from an endless series of turds that Hubbard, you know, flung out there. And, you know, just as part of the overall wall of nonsense, trying to, you know, burnish his reputation among, you know, Scientologists for being the smartest guy ever. So, you know, it's it's not, um, you know, it's not really remarkable that we missed this until now because it was just one of a series. It happens to be laughably bad. And when you take the mo- a few moments to dissect it, as we've done here, you know, it just... It it's quite entertaining to see just how bad it is. So anyway, I but I just think yep. you know Hubbard Hubbard just had this idea, this fantasy, this kind of Reader's Digest view of the world, right? That that shit's easy, and it's like it's not. If this stuff, if economic policy were easy, we'd never have a recession. It would just work. And even though we've got far better tools than we had when Reagan took office today. It's still hard. And yet Hubbard just had this sort of eight-year-old attitude, right, that, you know, eight-year-olds tend to believe that complicated things are easy because they understand just enough to, to find these incredibly simplistic solutions, but they don't have any ability to see the hard stuff. Anyway, well, it's, got, it's, it's an abridged, to your Reader's, <laughs> reader's Digest analogy, it's an abridged approach to life, right? Everything has been edited concisely and packaged in a way that involves no critical thought outside of what's in, right in front of you, right? <laughs> well, exactly. Right. And, that's, and that's the whole point of Scientology and cults in general, right, is yeah. they strip the people who were reading this and they were getting copied on this had their critical thinking faculties completely annihilated through the indoctrination process of Scientology. That's right. And, that's, and that really is, in, in wrapping this up, that is the point I wanted to bring this back to, is that... You know, Scientologists who read this stuff and uh, and you know even the and even later leave Scientology and still carry this with them. They're they're actually you know you're stupider for having read this and 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 believed it. That's the really honest, harsh truth here. And 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 I include myself in that. I bought into this line of reasoning and thinking, hook, line, and sinker, because it had the characteristics of being simple, easy to understand easily explain the world. And the world is a complicated place. I didn't want to deal with the complexity of it. I didn't have the time to even get into dealing with the complexity of it as a full-time Scientology staff member and then Sea Org member. So I was happy to have Hubbard explain it all to me and break it down in easy to digest, uh, easy to understand terms. And that's the worldview of a cult member. And unfortunately, when it comes to topics like finance, economics, uh, politics, governments, um, you know, it's not just in cults that that kind of thinking happens. Well, it's interesting, too, so I wanted to, you know, kind of show that. This reads like the way he expects you to deal with a problem or a solution in the data series. You know, he sets it up the way that I've, you know, from what I've been reading in my research and kind of talked about today in my post, but... You know, and and this is it. Just screams. Here is the way. Here's the confirmation bias. Here are these ludicrous assumptions. Here are these you know uh, abridged anecdotes that supposedly support the position, without any kind of you know external you know any kind of proper contextualization. So, uh, you know, again to your point about him being consistent about his anti-tax position, he certainly is consistent in the way that he follows his own his own rubric, as it were, you know, the way that he writes and how he wants things done and how he wants himself perceived within Scientology. Now, I don't know if I would want myself perceived in the world at large as the result of the contents of a letter like this, but that's a whole nother that's a whole nother question. <laughs> yeah, no, Hubbard was happy happy to be thought of this way. So yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for being part of this with me. Uh, I, I could not have broken down some of the details of this without your input and your understanding of some of these, you know, truly complicated issues that Hubbard attempts to make simple but fails epically at, I think we've shown. 
Um, which is not to say that you can't simplify some of these concepts, but not this way. No, <laughs> this, this ain't the way to do it. And that's, that's, and I wanted to give a little inside window into, um, into, into why some Scientologists and exes, uh, you know, have some of the ideas that they have and where Hubbard was coming from, uh, on this topic, uh, to just make that kind of clear, because I think it's, uh, also clear if you look at this, how that influenced so much of, um, how Scientology operates. So, all right, all right, guys. So again, thank you very much, and uh, and we're going to wrap up here. Thanks, Great. Again. thanks for having us. All right, bye bye.